Hi, my name is Chelsea Marks, and Ahuva Friedman and Madeleine Ben-Gigi and I will be discussing with you today a new non-invasive method to measure size distribution of mouse breast cancer metastasis in the lungs versus time for mathematical modeling. Cancer is the uncontrollable growth of transformed cells. It has been shown by Warburg in a classic review paper that there are 10 important hallmarks that labels a tumor as a cancerous growth. The important hallmarks for this talk that I would like to draw your attention to is immune evasion and metastasis. Immune evasion is when a cancer can cloak itself from the body's immune system in order to avoid elimination. Metastasis is when a cancer breaks cells off and sends them circulating through the bloodstream to form new secondary remote growths. In particular, we will be talking about breast cancer. Breast cancer is the cancerous growth in the mammary gland, specifically in the milk duct or the lobule of the breast. One in eight women will be diagnosed with breast cancer in the U.S. in her lifetime. It is also one of the leading causes of death for women worldwide. There are several associated hormones with breast cancer, being estrogen, progesterone, and HER2. These hormones control things such as pregnancy and milk production. For breast cancer, there are two major subtypes, hormone sensitive and hormone insensitive, more commonly known as triple negative breast cancer, TNBC. Within TNBC, there are two major categories, non-invasive and invasive. Non-invasive TNBC can be easily treated, however, only through surgery. There are no available hormone therapies for this type of cancer. Invasive TNBC is the worst prognosis of any breast cancer because it often metastasizes quickly and, as previously stated, has no available treatments. This is also the type of cancer that is a most common diagnosis amongst African American women who have been diagnosed with breast cancer. We are studying TNBC invasive metastasis in this study. After a breast cancer metastasizes, there are several spots that it is more likely to travel to, being the brain, the bone, the liver, and what we have discussed here in this talk, the lungs. Another key concept for cancer is dormancy and reoccurrence. After a cancer goes into remission post chemotherapy and surgery, a cancer remains dormant and unseen, potentially for an patient's entire life. However, the cancer can reoccur and come back. Reoccurrence typically decreases over time. However, there is a peak of recurrence at the 15 year mark. When analyzing genetically this 15 year mark reoccurrence and comparing it to the original tumor, they have been shown to be genetically identical, proving this is a true case of dormancy and reoccurrence. The motivation for this study is to create a mathematical model that predicts dormancy and reoccurrence as a consequence of slowly shifting near equilibrium between tumor growth and shrinkage. We have a model that demonstrates this through melanoma in zebrafish. There are several very important parameters for this model, being growth rate, reduction rate, and shedding rate. Here you see a visual representation of our model. As the cancer metastasizes and forms a secondary growth, we can find the metastasis birth date and through this look at metastasis rate. As the secondary growth continues to divide, we look at the relationship between reduction rate through cell death through things such as immune activity or treatment. We also look at growth rate through things such as mitosis and eventually shedding rate through, uh, through sending new cells off to shed and implant to form a now tertiary growth. In this model, we do not focus on the change of a single tumor because that is too statistical, but rather on changes to a large ensemble of tumors, that is to tumor size histogram. Seen in the graph is a data representation with our model of real human liver cancer parameters. We used actual liver cancer parameters for growth rate and metastasis rate. 
However, we made up our own reduction rate. As you can see, as we change reduction rate, we change the relationship of dormancy and reoccurrence over time. All big tumors above three years were removed. To test our hypothesis, we use Balpsy mice, a syngenetic mouse model that is causing non-immune response. And as a tumor model, we use 41 triple negative breast cancer cells. We use this type of cancer because this is the only non-human cancer model proven to show dormancy and recurrence in an immune competent animal. To do so, we use 24 mice. 20 were injected with 41 cells and 4 were used as controls. Of the 20 experimental mice, 10 were treated with anti-PD-1, a common immunotherapy drug, and 10 were untreated. After two weeks, we surgically removed the primary tumors and then measured lung metastasis sizes weekly. We will explain the method below. To measure metastasis sizes inside of a living mouse, one needs a non-invasive imaging technique. There are two classes of such imaging techniques, biological and medical. The biological technique is called IVIS, which uses a phosphorescent tag on tumor cells that is bright enough that a very sensitive camera can see its light through the skin. And fortunately, IVIS cannot see small tumors and it gives no size information. MRI is an excellent medical technique that unfortunately is very noisy in the air-filled lungs. It also requires long sedation times that could be fatal to sick mice. Therefore, we choose CT imaging. CT takes X-rays at many different angles and uses them to reconstruct a three-dimensional images of the lungs. As previously mentioned, CTs are x-rays taken over many slices, but also over many angles. This is very important for our analysis. We used Brooker Live Rodent CTs. With the corresponding machine came a set of software. The software takes three steps in order to collect and analyze these CTs. The first step is to se separate and sort the x-rays into three breathing phases. The program uses grayscale in order to distinguish the difference between the three breathing phases, being lungs fully empty, lungs half full, and lungs fully extended with air. All three breathing phases go into our reconstruction. Seen here is three different perpendicular 3D images of the mouse breathing over time. In this, you can see the breathing through the lung movement. Black is air, gray is tissue, and white is bone. The third and final step of the Th Brooker software system is to isolate and analyze the lungs. This is done by separating the lungs from the surrounding tissue of all on roughly 250 slices. Once the lungs are isolated from the surrounding tissue, we then use a macro that separates air from tissue plus tumor in the lungs. This is done by segmenting each region by filling it with spheres of maximum size for tissue plus tumor. The tissue plus tumor maximum size spheres are then separated into different volume ranges and the program creates a histogram with this. Due to the fact that CTs do not see the difference between tissue and tumor, each mouse acted as its own control. CTs were taken of the mouse prior to injection while it was still healthy and continued to be taken over time after injection. This allowed us to see the difference in amount of tissue for uh, pre and post cancer. We can then use a subtraction algorithm that will be discussed next in order to analyze what is tissue and what is tumor. Seen on the left is a graph representing the different volumes for total lung volume and tissue plus tumor volume over time. The bottom curve shows tissue plus tumor volume over time. The top curve shows total lung volume over time. As you can see, there is not too much noise. On the right is a stereotypical histogram created by the program. This is from a late stage tumor bearing mouse. 
At time point one, you can see a tissue volume distribution for the healthy mouse. At time point two, which is after the injection of tumor cells, you have a tissue plus tumor volume distribution. We assume the largest sphere in tissue plus tumor volume came from the largest sphere in tissue volume at time one. The largest sphere in time one was subtracted from the largest sphere in time two to yield a tumor volume. This was repeated for all the remaining spheres in order to create a tumor volume distribution. This process was repeated for all the scans. On the left, you can see a tissue plus tumor volume distribution with the lighter boxes on top representing the portion of the volume that was attributed to tumor. On the right is the resultant tumor distribution that was extracted using the subtraction algorithm. Here you can see a sample volume distribution that came from the control mouse. The volumes of the control mouse allow us to ensure there is not too much difference between scans. The algorithm was run on the control volume distributions to produce the histogram shown here. There are six consecutive times. Notice that all the spheres, particularly at later times, are confined to small volumes. The majority of differences lies below the 1500 range highlighted in red. So anything below that was attributed to noise and anything above that was signal. Now let's move to the sick mouse. Here you can see the tumor volume distributions that resulted from the subtraction algorithm. The volumes above 1500 times 10 to the minus 6 cubic millimeters are significant and grow with time. At the earliest times after tumor injection, there's only one box that can be considered significant. At later times, you can observe more tumor above the threshold and the number continues increasing subsequently. These values allow us to understand how volume changes with tumor growth over time, enabling parameter extraction. The total tumor volume over time was taken by summing the volumes in each distribution. The volume increases monotonically with time as the mouse got sicker as expected. These results will be validated by gold standard histology performed on the last scan after the mice are sacrificed. The subtraction algorithm of sick minus healthy mouse enabled us to distinguish between tissue and tumor volumes in CTs, since the CTs cannot do this on their own. We have demonstrated this method for one sick mouse and one control, but we will be implementing this on all 20 mice for which we have collected data. The collected histograms for treated and untreated mice will be used to get model parameters to predict under what conditions we can expect dormancy and recurrence. Thank you, and now we'd like to open the floor for any questions.